How many like adventure? Well, you're ready for an adventure then. How many don't like adventure? Uh, there's a few. You know, whether you like the adventure or not in your life, God uses it. So whatever side of the coin, if you like the same sandwich for lunch every single day, you eat the same cereal every single morning, you have the same routine, that's wonderful, that's fine. But listen, never miss God in routine. And never resist God when he messes with your routine. Okay? So if you don't like the messing with your routine, don't, just don't miss out on God. You can be uncomfortable with the messing with your routine, but don't miss out on God. Number two, if you like the change, uh, make sure you don't miss God in the enjoyment of change. Sometimes we get all exhilarated and all excited about the, the things that happen around us and just because you like it. You, you, want a, you want a new route to work every day. You get bored with the same thing and you want change. That's, a, that's okay too, but don't in that miss God. So he'll work in our lives, and it's an adventure and a journey. Today's question, as we look to today's message, a good question for today as we kind of go through this is, how can I more effectively witness to someone who does not know Christ? How can I more effectively witness to someone who does not know Christ? This is a great question. This is a good question because it's really a question that all of us should be continually asking, not others even, but the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to more effectively witness to those around me that do not know Jesus Christ. Because really, isn't that why God said he would pour out his spirit that you might be his witnesses, right? In Jerusalem and Judea and all around the world. And so a key component of this is reliance upon the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to I start out with something that makes you an ineffective witness, and I'm going to set you up because I'm going to go back to 1919, and probably in this room, no one was around then, okay? So I'm not going to offend you, uh, but I'm going to read something that happened in 1919, and then it was changed in 1923, uh, and uh, you'll think, where is he going with this? Just bear with me a few moments, because this is going to show you what's not effective in witness, and then I'm going to challenge you to think, how many times are we relying upon this approach an ineffective approach, and in doing so, we're missing out on the most effective approach of reaching and sharing Jesus Christ with people. In 1919, Congress ratified the 18th Amendment. Does anybody here know what the 18th Amendment is? You, hopefully, you know your Constitution and bylaws and Congress Amendment. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't know. Uh, somebody, I heard say it. Uh, and that was, uh, in the Constitution, that was prohibition the sale and the distribution of alcoholic beverages in the uh, United States. People who supported the amendment included the great evangelist Billy Sunday. And his ambition, as well as the, that of others, was good. The ambition was they truly believed that outlawing liquor, alcohol, in all forms, could improve society. And they had some good basis for that. It would prevent a lot of tragedy that we deal with even today. So that was their goal. Many people called this amendment, the 18th Amendment, the Great Experiment. That's its nickname. But the Great Experiment didn't work, largely because millions of Americans chose to uh, get past the law through working with bootleggers and going to speakeasies. And in 1923, the law was repealed. It basically was the great experiment that failed. And I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, I don't know what your experience or your background is. Uh, but the great experiment was um, this idea of we can make society better by passing laws. Now, believe me. I'm one who believes in law and order. We can't have chaos. And in fact, much of the modern contemporary mindset is that, that no law is better than law. That doesn't work. And all you have to do to see that is find a country like we saw in Iraq for a period of time. Find countries where law does not reign. There isn't some kind of order. And it's all corruption. And you'll find a place that nobody wants to live in. 
It's convenient, highly convenient to drive down the road and know that you're supposed to be going on the same side of the road in the same direction. But that's not everywhere because if that's not enforced to some degree, you have problems. So because the the hearts of men are broken, the law is actually given. But this 1918 uh, uh, amendment, that was the 18th Amendment in 1919 that was made, was based on a faulty premise. It was based on the idea that the law of man with good intentions could actually make society better. Billy Sunday, a great evangelist, supported this law. If I were there, I might have supported this law. But let me tell you what the premise that's wrong with it is. The premise was it ignored the fact that the Old Testament law didn't work either. It blatantly ignored. If the law that God had given had worked, we wouldn't have needed the New Testament. When we try to legislate morality, and I'm all for laws that protect people. I'm all for law and order. But I also want us to remember as a church that you don't effectively reach the world through legislation. Now today, it's not. It's not bootlegging. It's not alcohol. It's many other things. You pick it. Border immigration. You pick it. Abortion. And I I believe that killing of babies is absolutely wrong at every stage of life. Why? Because, man, the sanctity of life is valued. And I also believe that euthanasia that's being passed in other countries is wrong in every way. It is the, the devaluing of life. But I also believe that leaving someone go hungry when you could change it is equally wrong, According to the law of God. But we're not going to fix anything. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have laws, but we're not going to fix anything with the law. It didn't work. If the Ten Commandments didn't change man's heart, do you think the amendments are going to change his heart either? So, I say this first before we look at these scriptures because the grand experiment failed. And yet many believers today still try to approach witnessing and sharing Jesus Christ with others by applying the law. And it will not work. It will not work. Let's look at Romans chapter 7 and learn why this 18th Amendment failed um, and that there was a better way in which they could have approached this. I have discovered, this is Paul writing, I have discovered this principle of life. Now, shouldn't that fascinate you? You read those words, and here is Paul writing, and he says, I have discovered this principle. That should cause our ears to uh, turn towards what he's saying. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I've discovered this. I'm messed up. That's Scott Brown paraphrase. But that's what Paul is saying. I want to do what is right, but I inevitably do what is wrong. Who in this room doesn't relate to what Paul's principle is here? Haven't you discovered it? Don't eat that extra brownie, but I'm craving that extra brownie. I want to do what's right, but I inevitably do what's wrong. And then my my wife and son will ask me, what happened to the Oreos? They only put three rows in those things, or two rows in those things. I don't know why they have the third row. They, they could say plastic. I don't know. That's wrong. Verse 22. Note that what Paul says. Now, this is so important. He's got this struggle going on, but he says this. In verse 22, I love God's law with all of my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to sin that's still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. You want to know why there are so many naysayers in our society? And if you don't think there are, just turn on the news. I mean, those people need to get a new job. They need a new life because everything all the time is negative. Just, it's, it's sad. 
But Paul writes about this and says, I love the law with all of my heart. I want what is good. I want what is right. But there's something inside of me that's working against that. And this is why the law of the Old Testament, Scripture says, failed, not because it was imperfect, but because of the hearts of man. You see, legislating law or trying to get people to conform in a certain way will not set people free. And yet, sometimes the temptation to witness is about cleaning up something in their life rather than what it really needs to be about. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So as we keep reading here in verse 25, I thank God that the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The answer is not in another amendment. The answer is not in this or that. The answer is and only is in the person of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's the gospel. That's the message we care. Paul recognizes that there is a spiritual struggle within each human being. It's a principle of life. Paul recognizes that the law reveals the error of our ways, but the law doesn't transform our heart. The law is not what sets us free. In fact, fact, it just reveals the sin that is within us. He says, and I love how he says this, and the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. If we want to change society, if we want to make the world a better place, we're going to do it by sharing Jesus with others. Not the rules, not the law, not these things, not those things, not changing things. And I'm not saying we shouldn't stand for what is right, but I'm telling you the energy needs to go into the one thing that can change the position of a person's heart. Somebody is considering doing something uh, harmful to another human being. What will change that? A law, don't do it, and they just go out and kill them anyhow. Or changing their heart where they don't want to kill them. And Jesus does that. It's a transformation. And so when we took look at this idea, this question, how can I more effectively witness to somebody uh, who does not know Jesus? Well, number one is just rule out this idea that giving them a bunch of rules is going to fix them. It's not. Because the Old Testament was a bunch of rules and it didn't even fix Israel. There's a better way. It's Jesus. He is that better way. Now let's look over at John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning reading of verses 6 through 8, and let's look at something that's very peculiar in Scripture. It's an interruption. It doesn't make sense. And we read over it all the time. It's a familiar passage of Scripture, and yet it seems like this is a real odd set of verses. In fact, three verses, 6 through 8, are very peculiar in the context of this greater passage of Scripture. John's Gospel, chapter 1. In verse 6, it says, God sent a man, John the Baptist. Now, what is John talking about here? He's talking about Jesus in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the flesh dwelt among us. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He talks about Jesus Christ in verses uh, 1 through 5 and verses 9 on. But he sticks three verses in the middle of this chapter at the opening of his book that's all about Jesus Christ, was the Word, is the Word, and the Word has come to us. And he, he sticks these three verses, and the first, the verse 6 seems very out of character. He says, And God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. Now, it's interesting, he sticks this verse in here because he jumps from Jesus, which everything else that he's going to talk about is Jesus, and it's the light. Jesus is the light. We know that from Scripture. We'll we'll look at that in a moment. But then he inserts that, oh, by the way, God stuck John Baptist in there to tell about the light. Well, the light was already here. Jesus was already here, remember? Elizabeth and Mary were having children at the same time, right? John was a little ahead of Jesus. And so we see this unfold. Why does John stick this in the middle of everything about Jesus? Jesus is the light. Can't Jesus speak about himself? 
Yet, he chooses John the Baptist to tell about the light so that everyone might believe, believe because of his testimony. As we see there in verse 7 and then verse 8, it says, John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. So we turn on the light bulbs here. Do, do I need to be a witness and say, hey, the lights are on? Really? The light's here. You see it. You know it's on. It's there. It's present. So I want to underscore a couple things, but before we do this, of why these three verses are in here and how they relate to our personal witness, but before this, we do this, I want us to note this too. The gospel message John defines in chapter 20, verse 31. It says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing that you might have life in his name. These are written, it's recorded, it's spoken. What is a witness? A witness, or the gospel, is simply that which speaks about Jesus Christ in a way that allows others to find life in Christ. What's this newness of life look like? John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10, answers that. A thief comes only to steal and to kill, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, or some translations say abundantly. The, the word that is used in this context, the Greek word that is used here, means life in excess or life added to life. It is a surplus or overflowing of life. So basically, Jesus has come to give life in addition to the life we have. And that is spiritual life in God. And this is further expounded upon when Jesus has a dialogue with Nicodemus who comes and says, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. In other words, you have a double life. As a Christian here, not double life in a bad way, right? Double life, you always think of that and it's bad. You have two lives. You have your life as a human being, but then you are, through Christ Jesus, imputed a spiritual well-being, a spiritual life uh, that is put upon you above and beyond, something that goes beyond the, the, the life that you have been given just as you walk in the flesh here. And so this is that life and life to the full. It's life beyond this. Speaking of the excess or overflow, he adds life to our life. This is the gospel. Then our goal in witnessing really comes back to this gospel is what are we telling people about? Is it the 18th Amendment? Is it rules? Or is it Jesus? Remember, Jesus came to give life. Jesus came to do what the law could not do for man, not because the law is wrong, but because the law is powerless against a falling heart. All it does is expose wickedness. It doesn't change it. The 18th Amendment exposed the aspect of the ills of alcohol and what it was doing to society. But the changing of it just caused those people to find another way because the law didn't change the heart. In fact, it further complicated the situation and actually, as you study history, raised a lot of people to affluence and power that were very bad people because they were willing to break the law to make a profit. They were willing to kill people in making a profit. They were willing to do a lot of things to make a profit because why? The hearts of man were not fixed by the law. You can't legislate a heart into the kingdom. You don't make good people by laws. You make good people by a relationship with Jesus Christ, life more abundantly through Jesus Christ that transforms people. It makes us different. So going back to John 1, 6 through 8, I want to pull this out. The first thing we see here again is God sent a man named John. This verse is weird. It's stuck in the middle of this whole context. Everything in John's about Jesus, and yet you stick right here, John the Baptist. The first principle I want you to know on being a more effective witness is I want you to know this. God sent a human witness, that is John. In other words, be human. Just be human. Don't play the spiritual card. Don't play the greater than uh, thou, the card. Just be human. 
No one could testify to the light better than the light himself, that is Jesus Christ. And yet John the Baptist is used. John the Baptist is not the light. He's not the Son of God. He's just speaking about the Son of God. And isn't it interesting that God uses the imperfect to speak about the perfect? Be human. Just be real. And John is stuck in here like you and I are stuck in here. And you are dealing with people who are lost. They're in darkness. But you recognize that without the grace of Jesus Christ in your life, you also would be lost and in darkness. Be human, like Paul speaks of in Romans when he says, I know what I do. I want to follow the law, but I am imperfect in doing this. I want to be obedient, but I still struggle with obedience as I walk out my Christian life. I want to do what is right. So don't go to somebody with this air of superiority, this air and this idea that I know how to live, and I'm going to show you how to live. Go with a humility and a brokenness and say, I know what you're struggling with, and guess what? I struggle too. Maybe it's not the same struggle, but the same essence is there, and I have found help in Jesus Christ. Be human. Just be human. God's okay with that, and he emphasizes that, and John uh, highlights that by saying, I'm going to use John the Baptist. In the middle of Christ's story, he's going to testify to Jesus when Jesus probably could more efficiently testify to himself. Guess what? That means you can be a witness for Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a perfect person. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to be sin-free. Not that you're not striving for that. But Paul says, I press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I have not yet obtained, but I press toward that mark. So one of the key components of being an effective witness is just recognize who you are and accept it. It's okay. You are a man or woman, young or old, saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. You are somebody that has shown mercy and favor that you did not deserve, not unlike the person you are talking to. You are a person who has found hope not in the rules of uh, of, of, of the law but in, in, and not in the ritual of church, but you have found hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Just be human. Speak not of you, but speak of him, liberating you. And if you speak of yourself, speak so, do so with humility and a humbleness, recognizing how broken you are without Jesus. Because without Christ... You cannot. Now, with this, I just want to uh, give two quick notes in this be human part. uh, As you're being human, look at this. John the Baptist was called. Be alert to the possible calling of God on your life. Be alert to that. Because God may just call you. but, but, But there's someone better. Do you think John the Baptist felt that? He is the light. I, why, why am I testifying about the Son of God? Why am I? I know I'm a cousin, but why am I testifying about the Son of God? He can do this. He's an adult. He can speak for himself. So that means you and I need to be mindful and alert that God may be calling us. In fact, the truth is all of us are commissioned to be his witnesses. And this is why he pours his Holy Spirit into us. And then as that is going on, I also want us to note that you need to be ready to hear the testimony of others sent to you. So in other words, as you need to be ready to share the testimony of Jesus Christ, and that is the testimony of Jesus Christ in your life, you also need to be ready to receive the testimony of Jesus Christ from other people's lives. Be teachable. Being human recognizes I don't know it all. I haven't figured it all out. I've been serving the Lord for a long time, but I don't have all the answers. And what God is doing in somebody's life is important to me to understand and see and value. This is where our testimonies become incredibly valuable because a testimony reveals our humanity and the brokenness of such, but it also reveals his great mercy and the power to liberate us from that which we can't 
liberate ourselves from. So that's the testimony of Jesus Christ. Be human. Recognize there's a call. It can be a call. Listen to the voice of God in that, but also value your testimony and the testimony of others. Speak of what you know. And then in that next verse, it says, to bear witness to the light. Speak the truth in love. If you want to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, the truth must be spoken. It can't be your opinion. It can't be the opinion of society. It can't be what you want it to be. It has to be the truth. But that truth has to be delivered in love. And you can't separate these two or you get weird and false religions. If you separate love from, from the truth, you get legalism. But if you separate the truth from love, well, we just got to be loving and accepting. Well, you are accepting of the person because you value them because they are made in the image of God, flawed like you are. But that doesn't mean you say, well, that's okay. You can be whatever you want to be. No, that's not truth. You have some, some weird new age religion at that point in time. You don't have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it will not set them free. The truth in love is what we see here, and this is what John the Baptist is doing. He's, he's bearing witness to the light. The light is love. Jesus is love, but he is also truth. And you can't separate the word of God from the person of God because they are one and the same. The word became flesh. Now, the best way to illustrate this in your witness is found over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now note this, it says in verse 1, If I speak in all the languages of the earth and of angels, but don't love others, I'm only, I will only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You're just running your mouth. You just, go, go Google, Google gongs. I encourage you to do this. Google gongs. Because if I could have had one, there's all kinds of them. I didn't even know there were that many of them, but I looked it up. I did a little research on it. Google, the symphonic gong is my favorite one because you start rolling this thing. It starts building and building and building and building. And it's not, I always thought you just bang the things. But no, you just tap them, tap them, and it starts building and building and building. And the vibration there. And you get a really loud, I'm, all I am is a big, loud noise. And listen, you're not going to be effective witness if you try to legislate morality in a person's life. You're just a gong. You may be right, but you're just a loud noise, and it's not going to change a heart. How do we change people? We change people by having the love of Christ in us. Speaking truth, but holding to love. Be that loud clong. Verse, uh, verse 2, it says, and if I have the gift of prophecy, and if I understand all of God's secret plans, and possess all knowledge... Isn't that what we want to do? We want to go to people in the world and tell them, all right, I understand what God is, how, what he's doing. I got it all figured out. Here's what you need to do. If you approach witnessing that way, highly ineffective. Because that is not the way we approach witnessing. That's not a biblical approach. He said, don't worry about what you say. Right? Go. Go. Be my witnesses, but wait until one thing. You got through all the courses. You got all the scriptures memorized. You got the Roman road down, and then you can go. No, wait until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Then you will be my witnesses. You see how we want to keep going back to legislating how it works? We want to even legislate how we witness. This is the way to effectively witness. You know what you need to be a witness? You need to be a human being with Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. That's what you need. That's all the early church had. That's all it had. And they turned the world upside down. Why? Because they knew it wasn't the law. They were excited that it wasn't the law because it didn't work, but they knew it was Jesus. And they were more than happy to even die. As we talked about last week, sawed in half that the gospel of Jesus Christ would liberate people. Love has to be a driving component. To bear witness to the light, it must be truth and love. You can have all these things. And if I had faith that could move mountains and did not love others, I would be nothing. You want to be an effective witness? 
be honest with who you are. That doesn't mean you don't strive to go forward in Christ. You should be striving. That should be the desire of your heart. Paul writes that in Romans. But be honest with who you are, but love people. If you want to reach the lost, you actually have to love them as a person, not as a project. Get away from the idea of a project. They're not a program. Well, I want to check off. I want to get the bonus star on my chart for winning the most people to Christ. That sends the entirely opposite message of what the gospel is about. You love them because they are made by God in the image of God. And they may be incredibly messed up, but until you love them as you love Christ, until you love God with all of your heart and love your neighbors yourself, until you love them with that deep, passionate love and just be honest with where you're at, you're not going to be an effective witness. It's not about what you say. It's about the heart that is within you. Look at what Jesus did over and over again. If you study out the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, and it was perpetually with them. He spent time with them. He went fishing with them. He ate in their homes. He went to the wedding ceremonies. He did all those things. Why? Because he wanted a free meal at a wedding? No, because he loved people. He cared for them. And this is what transformed the people around Jesus Christ. The disciples messed up over and over again. They got the message wrong completely many times, but Jesus kept loving them. One disciple would even directly, all of them betrayed him. We think of Judas, but all of them betrayed him. Peter Peter denied he even knew him, but he was loved by Jesus. Go tell the disciples and tell Peter, I'm risen. What is that? That's the love of God for them. He loved them in spite of their failures, in spite of their shortcomings with the law. He loved them. He cared for them. If you want to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, you actually just have to love people. Messed up people. By the way, look in the mirror and say, oh, You know, if you're struggling with loving yourself because you're so messed up, you're missing the point that Jesus loves you, and he knows how messed up you are. He knows it better than you're willing to admit to it. So love yourself in Christ and love others. And effective witnesses. We read through this whole chapter. So what does love look like? Love in verse 4 says, love is patient and kind. Well, I've witnessed to them five times. Love is patient and kind. Are they a project or are they a person? Are they a project or a person? Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Well, I used to be like you, but now I am living right. Love is not boastful or proud. Right? It's humble. Love does not demand its own way. Well, if you're not going to come to my Bible study, fooey to you, right? Done with you. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Well, I don't know how many times i got to tell that guy to stop it. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. Well, I just can't witness to them because they're just mean-spirited and I dealt with that enough and I'm going to have that in my life. You know what that is? Self-love. But it's not loving of others and it's not Christ-centered love. So when we look at this whole principle, we walk through this, how do I become more effective? It it does not rejoice in injustice. It, It rejoices whenever truth wins out. See, love and truth are linked together here in this passage on love. Truth wins out. In other words, you don't cover up, but it doesn't go either way. 
Years ago, uh, the, um, the interesting thing is, and the challenge to, to all of us here, and this is just a great way of illustrating it. I don't think it's the context of our family and body here, but it, we used to, the church used to be really good at being down on alcohol and down on smoking. Meanwhile, we were really good at gossip and backbiting and snickering, right? We would preach hellfire and brimstone if you smoked. Now, I don't think smoking is a good choice because it stinks. That's a personal opinion. I don't think it will send you to hell. Maybe not want a pastor to tell you that. It just makes you smell like you've been there. But man, we could, we could wax eloquent on why you shouldn't know. It's bad for your body. You say that when I'm this big around and going back to the buffet for the 15th time, and gluttony is listed, by the way. And I'm not saying weight is tied to gluttony because I know people that are thin that are gluttonous. Because sometimes it's a medical thing. So you can't weigh it on that. See, we get judgmental. When we look at this idea of being truthful in love, it means saying, I value you as a person. I may disagree with your eating habits. I may disagree with your life choices. I may disagree with your, your, your opinions politically, but I love you as a person because Christ loves you. When we start treating people like that, you will become a much more effective witness. Does that mean you don't want things to change in your life? You do. But don't make it your project. Turn it over to Jesus. Because your law can't change their heart, and they don't have the power to overcome sin by their own power, or Jesus wouldn't even be needed. What they need is the same thing you need, the same thing I need, the same thing everyone needs, and that is Jesus. And what we get in Jesus is an incredible amount of grace and power to see transformation. Now, sometimes people get things in their life and their addiction or their struggle, whatever it may be, it seems to just fall off like this right away. Boom, it's done. And other times people struggle through that and war with that and, and they walk through that journey. But all the time, it's Christ and Christ alone who sets us free. So as we want to be a witness, we got to get away from things and get away from this idea that's really going back to the, to the now you see why I used the, uh, the 18th Amendment in 1919, the principle of that thing, the spirit of that thing was a good thing, but the flaw was it forgot what Scripture shows us, and that is the law doesn't liberate. If you want to be an effective witness, stop trying to make people like yourself and just start trying to share Jesus. In every conversation, in every component, you can do this. You say, well, I feel embarrassed because i got issues in my life. Okay, you're human. You're human. If you lie about those issues, now you're separating love and truth. You just say, all right, I'm, hey, you know what? You're my neighbor. You know I'm messed up. But I love Jesus, and I know Jesus loves me. And he is making a difference in my life and giving me the ability to change in ways I can't otherwise change. And guess what? He can do the same thing in your life. Are there areas of your life you'll want to change? Don't pick the areas for the person. Right? We want to pick the areas, right? I want you to change in this way. Forget it. Don't you think the Holy Spirit knows how best to change people? Then let the Holy Spirit do it. Now, when a subject comes up and it's clearly clear that their life is not aligned with Scripture, your goal isn't to fix that subject, but you be truthful about it. Hey, this does not align with Scripture, and here's what I encourage you to do. Here's 12 steps of how you fix your life. No. Yeah, your life doesn't align with Scripture, but I know this. If you will keep pressing into Jesus, he'll help you with that. I haven't had that struggle. Or even if I had that struggle, I, you know, I, my journey of finding victory over it is the same but entirely different than yours because it's the same because it's only Jesus. It's entirely different because the way, the steps that God, the Holy Spirit led me in may be different from yours, but I know the outcome will be the same. You will be set free in the name of Jesus. Stop giving them rules. Just give them Jesus. 
unapologetic, but loving. So John here in that verse 7 is truth and life. It's wrapped together uh, with love. He, he is to bear witness to the love of Christ, the truth of Jesus Christ, and he carries that forth. And all of Corinthians 13 speaks of that and talks about the power um, of just sharing and being a witness before Jesus Christ. And verse 11 gives us an understanding because sometimes when you look at these things, I look back in my ministry. I can do that now. I'm old enough. I'm not old. Well, at least that's what I tell myself. But I'm old enough. I look back at my ministry. There were so many dumb things. Guys, I apologize to you now because I've done some dumb things as a pastor. Don't laugh too hard. You're astounded? No, you're not astounded. I've been here with you 14 years. You know I've done some dumb things as a pastor. It's the journey of life. I look back on some things, but here's, he even gives us hope in verse 11 of Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I thought as a child, and I reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. You see, isn't that the story of our Christian journey? Guess what? Earth-shattering revelation. This afternoon, you will be older than you are this morning. You're growing up all the time. It's just happening. And so even as you go along in this Christian journey, what you understood, if you have been on this journey for any length of time, what you understood 15 years ago is going to be different than what you understand today. And guess what? Tomorrow, today will change. My journey some years ago with that medical situation, it changed me. I would never volunteer to go through that. I don't recommend it at all. Find a different and easier way. But yet, God will use everything in our life, good things, hard things, what we see as bad things, but they're things God will use to grow us and mature us. So we're perpetually growing, and so should our witness be. You say, man, I've done a pretty bad job at witnessing. Why? Because I, I go and just say, hey, you're a bad person. You need to be saved. That's true. Maybe absent of a little bit of love. Saying, hey, how do you feel about life? What are your worries? What are your concerns? You know what? That particular one I resonate with, and here's how Jesus helped me in a relationship with Jesus helped me. And you begin to be human, loving, and truthful, then you can begin to have that conversation. You know this? People who know you love them, actually will listen to you longer than people who don't think you care. If you want a voice, if you want to be a witness, how do you witness? Love people. That doesn't ignore the truth. It's just how it is. And we grow and mature in this, and God's grace abounds with this. Uh, the last thing I want us to note is the last verse here. Um, what is the point of uh, 6, 7, and 8? What was the point of John's witness? Is that, that people might believe. Believe what? Believe what I say? No. Believe on Jesus. Believe on John the Baptist? No. John the Baptist was not the light. He was only speaking of the light. Believe on the light. You don't have to believe on me. In fact, I don't want you to believe on me. And none of us should ever seek that. It's not about the credibility of our uh, person. It's about his nature, his person. And so that is the goal. we got to keep the goal in mind. And the goal is simple. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Not a Bible study. Not a prayer meeting, although those are wonderful things and will be a part of the Christian journey and are helpful tools. Jesus. If you're banished to the Al and the Patmos, what do you need? Jesus. If you're addicted to drugs, what do you need? Jesus. If you've got a... a, 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 um, uh, a uh, High paying job, what do you need? Jesus. If you got a low paying job, what do you need? Jesus. It's not about your wealth. It's not about your poverty. It's not about your education or lack thereof. It's not about your skill set. It's not about your family. It's not about your divorce. It's not about your marriage. 
It's not about the problem that you see in life right now. Sometimes that's the, the, our witnessing flaw is we want to fix their problem in life. Well, my marriage is falling apart. Well, what do you need? Well, Jesus will fix this. Well, yes, he can make a big difference in this, but what do you need? You need to be right with Jesus because your life is falling apart. Your marriage is secondary. That may sound strange, but it's secondary. Because you have some of the problems you have because some of the choices you are making. But guess what? You can be in a scenario where you're not making all the bad choices. Maybe the other person is making some of the bad choices too. And you can't control that. So what do you need if it does fall apart? Jesus. What do you need if you're going to get married? Jesus. What do you need if you're employed? Jesus. What do you need if you're unemployed? A job? No. Jesus. You see, the focus has to be in the right place. If we're going to be an effective witness, it's not about fixing them. It's not about teaching them that we have a hocus-pocus genie in a lamp that we rub it four times and it fixes everything in life because if anyone has lived any length of time, you know that life doesn't go as you plan it. But better day. Better is one day in his courts. Better is one day in his house than a thousand elsewhere. You see, what people need is not your solution to their problem. They just need Jesus, the same thing you and I need. So how do you become a more effective witness? Keep in mind these just simple principles. You are simply called to, to be who you are in Christ. It's your life. It's a testimony about him at work in you. Be human, be real, be honest. Then share the truth in love. Don't make them a project, actually love them. You say, well, how do I do that? Pray. If you don't love people, and if you don't love somebody God has placed in your life, the first temptation is to run. But the biblical answer is to pray. Right? Right? I want to avoid this person. Why? Because they make me uncomfortable. Maybe God wants you to be uncomfortable. You ever consider that? Maybe he wants to speak into your life. But by doing that, by loving them, you say, what happens then is you have to actually pray through. That's an old-fashioned idea. We want everybody else to pray through with us, but no, we just need to get before the face of God and we need to pray and say, Lord, give me your heart for this person who I don't like. You know you can love somebody you don't like. It's a weird twist, but it's the love of God that allows you to do that. You can actually love somebody you don't like and strangely care about their well-being. And guess what that means? You're pressing closer to Jesus. And that'll transform you. It'll change you. So, and then keep the mission simple and right in mind. I'm going to invite the worship team up. Just Jesus. Only Jesus. As the worship team comes up, here's what I want us to reflect on as we close out this service today. I, I, I didn't answer the five steps on how to be a better um, uh, witness. The truth is the Holy Spirit will lead you in that per person, per case. There are lots of tools out there you can help sharpen yourself, but never rely upon them. Only rely upon the Holy Spirit. But if you'll love people, if you'll be honest, if you'll be genuine, if you'll hold the truth, if you'll only present Christ and Christ alone, then you will become a much more effective witness at helping people discover the person who can set them free and save them. It's not near as hard as sometimes we make it. It's scary, but it's not really scary because it's just trusting him. You don't have to figure it out. You have to just trust him and be with people around you.